Amen. Amen. If you will, turn your Bible to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 5, and we're going to begin on ver with verse 12. This is, nobody really knows who the writer of Hebrews is. Some people think it was Apostle Paul. Some believe it was another um, apostle called Apollos. But nobody really, really know who wrote the book of Hebrews. But the book of Hebrews uh, blends right in with all the other books of the gospel. So we know it was written by a gospel writer and it was inspired by the Holy Ghost. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. He said, when for, the, for when the time, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. But strong meat belong to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We're going to talk to you from the topic today of growing in the Lord. You may have your seat. We're going to talk about growing in the Lord. One of our goals in this ministry is to produce spiritually mature Christians that will fulfill the commission given to the church by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Spiritual immaturity is not something new because we see right now uh, in the book of Hebrews where the, it sounds like the writer was a little bit frustrated with his audience because he said for the time that you've been saved, you ought to be further along. For as long as you have been saved now, I should be able to reveal something to you besides something that will get you excited and running around the church. I should be able to give you something that will, be, that will help to produce spiritual maturity in you. Because he said that the, the milk, I'm still feeding you with milk. What I want to feed you with some of that hamburger and pork chops and steaks. I wanna, but if you don't have teeth, you can't eat it. And if you're not spiritually mature, you can't digest it. So he was saying for the time that you've been saved, you ought not still be a baby in the church. You ought not still be wrestling with lying. You ought not still be stuck with fornication, living with somebody that's not your husband and not your wife. You should not be walking around cussing and living an ungodly lifestyle. Your lifestyle should be different. After, for the time you've been saved. Now see, baby Christians are still a mess. Sometimes with baby Christians, you can't hardly tell them apart from the unsaved people because they still got those old ways that they're trying to overcome. They're still fighting with strongholds and they're still, every time you might see them, a cuss word might slip out or something like that. They might not want to, but they haven't grown to a point where they learn how to conduct themselves in a way that resemble God. So he let us know that, uh, that we are supposed to grow in the Lord. And we're going to talk later on about the process because we won't want anybody to get to the point where they are, are confused because I, I'm still messing up and still doing some things. And so somebody said, well, you're not saved because you're still doing this and you're still doing that. That's not necessarily the case. It's just that you haven't grown yet. But as you grow, you'll start out. That, that's a beautiful baby right here on the front row. But you know what? If that baby looked like that uh, three years from now, that mama would be finding something wrong with that baby. I mean, that baby purity for the, for the stage it's in right now. But if it still looked like that five years from now, you'll find out you want something wrong. And so what it is, you want to begin to grow. Now, the truth is that we all start out as babies. Uh, set, go to Second Peter, chapter number 2. See, I thank the Lord for Evergreen Church because there are things that I can teach here that would not be very popular in a lot of other churches because y'all pastor don't know how to grab his ear and scream and, and shout and all that, can fuss at you and all that. I don't know how to do all that. All I know how to do is give you the word of God. And I hope and pray that you will receive the word of God because it's the word of God that changes lives, 
The word of God will transform your life. You know, I thank God for praise and I thank God for worship. But you know, praise and worship is not what's going to make you strong. Amen. Praise and worship will keep you encouraged. Praise and worship will help you to glorify God. But praise and worship won't make you get strong in the Lord. The thing going to make you get strong in the Lord is the word of God. And until you get an appetite for the word of God, you are going to be stuck in nothing but praise and worship. And you're going to be stuck in the same position. You're still going to be cussing. You're still going to be fighting. You're still going to be lying. You're still going to be living the same way you did before you got saved. Because you got to grow. And just because you get saved don't mean you just grow automatic. Growth is up to us. It depends upon us how we grow in the faith. All right, 1 Peter chapter number 2. And um, let's see, did I choose the wrong thing? Yeah, I went to 2 Peter, but I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter number 2 and beginning at verse 1. He said, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speaking. Now, who's supposed to lay that stuff aside? No, the Holy Ghost going to take all that from you, right? Now, no, 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 don't tell me that. When you get saved, the Holy Ghost going to take all that stuff from you, right? All that lying, all that malice, all that guile, all that hypocrisies, all that envying and evil speaking, the Holy Ghost going to take it all away from you when you get saved. Is that right? No. no. The Holy Ghost gives you the power. It gives you the ability, but you have to lay it aside. Amen. So that's why he said lay it aside. Then he says, as newborn babes desire the sincere of the milk of the word that you might grow. You need the sincere milk of the word in order to help you to grow. But what's the sincere milk of the word? That's talking about repentance. That's talking about uh, for knowing that you are forgiven. That's talking about knowing that you are a child of God. That's talking about the grace of God. You need to know all of these things, but don't just stay stuck right there. You got to go beyond all of that because the milk is to, to see, grown folk can't live off of just milk. Amen. Now, I know when we had babies, I don't know how they are right now, but I know when we had babies, about the only thing you could give them when they were newborn was milk. That's about the only thing their sisters could digest. But if you keep giving them milk, eventually they're going to grow and they're going to get some teeth and they're not going to want to just milk. They're going to want some food from the table. And then you might have to smash that up and give it to them and they eat it like that. But then a lot of times once you start feeding them that table food, they don't want to go back to the milk. Amen. Now that's nothing wrong with milk, but milk was just not suitable for them because now they have grown. There are some basic principles of Christianity that you need to get settled from the beginning. Amen. And I'm going to say this, a lot of you ain't going to like me after this, fornication, you ought to be settled. Amen. You ought to know if you are a married man, you ought to know that you got a wife. I don't care how pretty that other woman look, you ought to have that settled in your mind right. that this, I got a wife, and that's what I'm going to stay with. I mean, it's just certain things you need to have your mind made up. You need to set your mind and throw away the key and don't have no room for compromise. Amen. Amen. There are some things that, that ought to be settled in your spirit. Now, keep, keep going back, lying. Okay. Amen. Use a profanity, all kinds of stuff. There are some things that you ought to just be settled. I'm, I'm through with it. I don't, I don't have to struggle with that anymore. Right. My mind is already made up know, when it comes to certain things. Amen. You just, it's just certain things you ain't going to get me to do. Come on, because my mind are already made up. Amen. And I'm not flexible in those areas. See, the devil wants you to compromise with just a little bit. That's why they talk about a little living, living the whole month. You start out with a little sin in your life. And then as you start out with that little sin, then you'll find yourself doing another little sin. And then it continues to grow. And after a while, you got lost control. Amen. Amen. Amen now, um, I ain't trying to stir y'all up. They've been trying to help you to grow. Okay. So the process starts with laying aside some things and putting on other things. Go to the book of 2 Peter now. Chapter number 2. And let's start looking at verse number 20. Because, see, it's so important that we lay aside our old way of doing things 
that if we don't, we'll get stuck right back into it. And we'll find ourselves doing the same things that we did before we got saved. And I know that there's a teaching, they call it once saved, always saved, or eternal security. And, and, and basically with that, it's, it's teaching that you can kind of, it doesn't matter what you do, because your sins, they say, are forgiven, covered by the blood, past, present, and future. But if you search, and if you go to the book of Romans, I didn't write it down, but it's in Romans chapter number five, it talks about how he forgives us for our sins that are past. You got to deal with your present and your future. That's why the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, if we got to confess our sins and, and, and ask him to forgive us our sins, that means the sins must not be already forgiven before we did, before we asked for it. That means we can go ahead on and practice ungodliness and don't have to worry about it because it's already covered. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches those sins that are past, there's nothing you can do with your past. You can't change your past. So what you do is you ask God to forgive you and then you move forward. And then whenever you start to see yourself falling or making a mistake, you need to learn to repent, accept God's forgiveness, and then move on. Don't let the devil cause you in bondage because the same blood that cleansed you in the beginning is still good. That blood is still good, and it will continue to cleanse you as you continue in the process of moving from, from a baby to a spiritually mature person. Okay, now Peter talked about uh, the process of how you can end up, if you don't, in the danger of not uh, getting rid, not laying aside and not making changes. He talked about the danger of that. But I'm just going to jump in on, uh, on this scripture. And you need to read the whole chapter in order to get an understanding of what he's talking about. But I'm just going to start on verse number 20. He said, for if after they have escaped the pollution of the world, what is the pollution of the world? The teachings of the world, the things that we hear on the news that's acceptable, and the things that society says is okay, but God says it is not okay. God calls it pollution. So it said, once you have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because see, when you learn about God, then you got to decide, is God right or is the world right? Is God right or is what somebody else says? Dr. Phil right or is Oprah right or is some of them else? Are they right or is God right? And so you've got to come to the conclusion and know that through the word of God that God is right. He says, for if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then it says they are again what? Entangled. Therein, and then what? Overcome. The latter end is what? Worse with them than the beginning. So you can mess, you can, God can bring you out of a mess. But after God bring you out of the mess, you allow yourself to get back into the mess. And then not only get back into it, you didn't take time to repent. You didn't take time to ask God to forgive you. You didn't take time to get back in line, but you stayed in the mess. And when you stayed in the mess, then you got entangled with it. Now the mess got you bound again. You're right back in the same shape you were doing. You're just lying like you used to lie. You're still like you used to steal. And you're doing the same things that you used to do before you got saved. So he was saying, then you become overcome. Then he said the latter end is worse than the beginning. Well, how the latter end going to be worse than the beginning? I mean, if you wasn't saved in the beginning, how are you going to be worse off than you were before you got saved? Y'all believe the word, don't you? So it said the latter end is worse than the beginning. Now look at this. This is something that really stirs, that really kind of shake you up. And a lot of people get scared because of this next verse. He said, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the Holy Commandment to live with it. In other words, he was saying it was better for you before you got saved to live that ungodly lifestyle than it was after you get saved to turn back into that godly lifestyle, ungodly lifestyle. Well, what make it worse? The thing that makes it worse is that now you have exposed to the truth, you're not going to be happy on your way to hell now. I mean, a person that don't know the hell, that, do you know that people, for instance, right now, you can't see it and I can't see it, but suppose right now down the road there was somebody, some drunk driver that is driving, and 20 minutes after you leave here, you're going to be dead. Now, if you already know that, 
you will be upset because I, I'm not, I'm kind of, you know, but if you don't know it, you drive down the road just happy, go lucky. I mean, you're just happy and everything until it actually happens. Well, unsaved people, they are not aware, really aware of the knowledge of God. They're not really aware of the lifestyles of God. They're not really aware of the reality of God. So they can go to hell happy. But now that you've been saved, you know God is real. You know heaven is real. You know hell is real. You know eternity is real. You're not going to be as happy going to hell now as you were before you got saved. So the Bible says you're worse off after you get saved and then go back into it. Don't go back into it. You don't have to. God, by his grace and by his mercy, enables us. None of us are perfect. All of us fall into stronghold. But be quick to repent. Be quick to turn back. Be quick to say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, help me. Lord, strengthen me. Be quick to turn back to God. Because God is merciful. And God is good. God loves you. God don't stop loving you when you mess up. He loved you in spite of yourself. He loved you in spite of your mess. And God said, return unto me, and I will return unto you, says the Lord. He's right there waiting on you to come back. Just like the Bible talks about that prodigal son. That son was safe while he was in the house. But then he decided he wanted to be like the world. He decided he wanted to enjoy the, his inheritance before the time come for him to get it. So he went out there, and he wasted it. But when he wasted the Bible said he came to himself. And when he came to himself, he went back to his father's house. And the father was, was looking down the road waiting on him to come back. That's how God is about one of his children. God waiting on you to come back. God waiting on you to return. God ain't ready to, to, to chastise you for the mess that you made. God is ready to forgive you for the mess that you made and put you back into the family. Amen. God loves you just that much. It's hard to get unsaved after you get saved <laughs> because the Holy Spirit will convict you. The Holy Spirit will stir up in you and you will know that that ain't right. You will feel, un you'll get that uncomfortable feeling because you know you're outside the will of God. You know that's what I was, not, not what I was taught to do. You know that's what I'm not supposed to be. I'm supposed to be different from this. And now I find myself back into what I came out of. And the Bible say, you're worse off than you were before you ever got saved. And then look what he says in verse number 22. He said, but it happened to them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the side it was washed to her own water in the mouth. How many of y'all ever seen a dog do that? I used to have a dog when I was a little boy. That dog would vomit. I know it sounds nasty. But then he'll turn right around and eat it again. The Bible says that's what it's like when we turn right back into sin. We just like that dog. That vomited up and then ate it. That's the way God looked at it. Don't do that. I just want you to know that God loves you. Don't settle for an ungodly lifestyle. Learn to grow in the Lord. And the more you grow up in the Lord, the easier it is to resist temptations. The more you grow up in the Lord, the, more, the easier it is for you to kind of walk upright. We're going to talk about that a little bit too. Go to Hebrews Chapter number three. Hebrews chapter number three. And let's look at verse number 12. It says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. How many of y'all know the Bible teaches us that God said he would never leave you and he would never forsake you. Do y'all believe that's true? Amen. It's the word of God. So God will never leave you. Now, I'm going to throw this on you, analogy, and you might say that's crazy, Pastor. This building right here would never leave you. If you stay in the building, we got air conditioning for the summer, we got heat for the winter. We got a covering over you to protect you from the rain. As long as you are in this building, you are covered from the elements. And it's a beautiful place to be. But do you know the problem somewhere around 1 o'clock, we're going to leave this building. <laughs> the building won't leave us. But you can leave the building. Amen. It says... Beware, okay, let me read it again so y'all won't think I'm making up nothing. 
Take heed, that means to be aware, brethren. And when you say brother, that means you're talking to safe folk, right? Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. When you get to the point where you refuse to believe the word of God, the Bible calls that an evil heart. And then when you have an evil heart and you refuse to believe, then what happens? Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Wait a minute, I've gone a little too fast. Uh, an evil heart of unbelief in what? Departing from the living God. When God saves you, God does not take away your free will. You still can choose whether you're going to stay in the word of God or whether you're going to turn away from the word of God. You still got your choice. God doesn't take away your free will. So you can't depart from him. He'll never leave you, but you can leave him. Okay? And then it says, but exhort one another or encourage one another daily while it is called today. Don't wait till they get down the road. Encourage one another. When you see your brother or your sister falling away, encourage them. Don't try to condemn them, but encourage them and let the Holy Spirit do the convicting in them. But you keep encouraging them. When they mess, and the Bible says, consider yourself, lest you also be tempted, because you haven't made it either. Amen. So something may come into your life, and you need somebody to encourage you. Amen. So it says, encourage one another while it is today. It says, lest any of you be hardened with the deceitfulness of sin. This morning when I was meditating on this, I was thinking about, I used to grow a garden in my back yard behind the yard when I lived on Elizabeth Street. And I never really liked wearing gloves. So I would go out there with the hoe and the shovel and the rake and work in the yard when your hands are not really prepared for it. So what happens? Your hands will start to work blister because your hands are sensitive. And then after your hand blister and start getting sore, if you keep doing it, what happens? After a while, your hands start getting hard in those areas. It'll start getting callous in those areas so that you can do it and it won't hurt you because your hand is protecting itself with those calluses. That's the same way sin is. You see, whenever you are saved and you find yourself doing something that you know is contrary to the will of God, it'll bother you. The Bible talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. But since God does not take away our free will, you can still do it. And the more you do it, the easier it gets for you to do it. Amen. You will get to the point where your heart, it used to bother you when you used to do it. But now you've done it so long, you have become hard to it, and now you can do it without even thinking about it. I remember when I was, um, I hadn't been saved very long, and I was working on second shift for the railroad. And the church that I was in, they had a church on Wednesday night and Friday night. But since I was working on Wednesday night and Friday night, I couldn't go. But when I got, first got where I couldn't go, it bothered me because I was used to being there. And the man of God that we had, it was like God would, would, would deal with him and tell him some things. It looked like he was all on, on your job with you. And it was like he was right there observing things that were going on on your job. And, 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 and then he would be telling you about things. And I used to enjoy that. I loved that because I know it was revelation how it coming from God and it helped me to grow. So I was always in church on Wednesday night and Friday night. But now that I'm working on Wednesday night and Friday night, I can't go. And it, and it bothered me. But you know what? After about a year or so being on, on second shift, I didn't even think about Wednesday and Friday night. It didn't even cross my mind anymore because I had become accustomed to not doing it. That's the same way it is. When you are in sin, if, and, and some of y'all I know COVID probably stopped some of us from coming to church and, and it bothered you when you couldn't come to church. And now that you can come to church, you're so used to sitting home and watching it on TV, you don't even come back anymore. <laughs> Talking to some of y'all, okay? <laughs> All right. Go to the book of Ephesians chapter number four. You get comfortable. And that's not a good thing when you get comfortable in doing something wrong or something that's not going to help you to grow. Ephesians chapter number four. 
and verse number 17. We're talking about growing in the Lord. You can't grow when you're carrying a whole bunch of baggage. Amen. Amen. Things that hold you back. Bad habits that hold you back. Bad lifestyles is holding you back from growing in the Lord. And the more you grow in the Lord, the stronger you become so that the, when the enemy come, you won't be defeated. Because the Bible says that Satan goes around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for somebody weak. I love playing chess. And uh, one of my chess buddies, um, Pastor Reggie Green, he always looked for a weak piece. If you leave a piece unprotected, he's going to take it. He said, I'll knock his helmet off. That's the way he was looking for those weak pieces. And, and when you start dealing with the weak pieces, even if they're little pieces, in the end game, you're going to miss those little pieces. And so that's how he ended up beating me and Brother Kurt Hill most of the time because he'd be looking for the weak pieces. We're trying to win in a hurry. So we beat him, but most of the time he beat us because he deal with those, he get those weak pieces. And that's what the devil do. The devil find a weak place in your life and look for weak people, he'll devour you. That's his job. Amen. Amen. And so what we have to do is we got to become strong. It is our responsibility to become strong. You know, the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen. When you are strong in the Lord, the devil would check you out, but he finally can't do nothing with you. Amen. That's the same thing when the devil uh, went up, con confronted God concerning Job. And the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? And he said, yeah, I consider him, but I can't do nothing with Job. Amen. Job is Job wrapped up in your word. He wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in your word. I can't do nothing with him because you got him covered. That's the way we need to live our life, to wear the covering of God, the glory of God. I heard Pastor Tom Miller teaching, and I don't know if it was last, his last Sunday service or the Sunday before that. But anyway, when he was teaching, he was teaching about how being covered with the glory of God. That was one of the most powerful messages I have ever heard. Because, see, when you cover with the glory of God, the devil can't get to you any kind of way. He got to get past the glory to get to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And the more you walk in the word of God, the more you find yourself covered with the glory. The more you, the, 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 easy, the harder it'll be for you to get insulted. Amen. Some of you can say, your mama, and y'all ready to fight. They ain't said nothing about your mama, just say, your mama. And you ready to fight. Amen. You got to get past all that stupid mess and get to the point where all kind of stuff don't bother you. You walk up in the crowd and, and they stop talking. They talking about me. So, Amen. I couldn't care less. I ain't got nothing to do with that. Say what you want to say. I'm accountable for what I do and how I live. I'm not accountable for what you say. Amen. Learn how to not get tied up in all that little petty stuff. Amen. Get beyond all of that. People talking about you. Big deal. They talked about Jesus. And you ain't no better. You ain't never as good as he was. So what make you so special people can't talk about you? Let them talk. Amen. Amen. All right. You got to get to the point where you don't let that stuff bother you. You got to get past all of that. They didn't. I, I did this. I spent $25 and they didn't say nothing about it. Get past all that mess. Amen. Grow. See, when you're a baby Christian, you don't whine about everything. Yes. You know, I had to chastise myself. <laughs> I did since I've been afflicted with that kind of stuff, you know. I started having a problem with the heart, and the Lord uh, delivered me through the doctors and everything from the heart problem with the, uh, the, the what you call it, the, 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 not vessels, what they call them, the arteries and stuff and stuff like that with the arteries. And then after that, I started getting a tight with uh, blood flow down my legs and stuff like that. And I found myself whining like a little old baby. And I said, shut up. <laughs> Every time somebody asked me, yeah, I'm doing all right, but this thing here is going to give me a... <laughs> I was complaining just like a little old baby. <laughs> and I had to tell myself, shut up. People don't really care. <laughs> when, they, when they say, how you doing, they don't care. They don't really want to know how you doing. <laughs> They're just being polite. <laughs> Talking about how you doing? Hey Amen. They just being polite. They don't want you to get to know history about about what's going on in your life. <laughs> okay, Pastor Anderson. 
Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 17. He said, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, walk like the unsaved people walk, in the advantage of their mind, they think they're better, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feelings have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have learned him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Christ, that you do what? Put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. Stop acting like you did before you got saved. Stop talking like you did before you start saved. Stop hanging with the kind of people that you did before you got saved. Put a difference between clean and unclean. Put a difference between holy and unsold, holy. Put a difference between saved and sinner. Put a difference between righteous and unrighteous. You can do it because you've been born again. Okay, yet you put off, you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, the person you used to be, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be what? Renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you do what? Put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holy. We got to pull off our old ways. We got to pull off our old habits. We got to drop all those old uh, addictions and things like that that had us bound, that old lifestyle. We got to pull it off. See, God not going to snatch it off of you, but he give you the ability to pull it off. That's why you got to grow in the Lord. Don't let stuff stick to you. Amen. Amen. Be quick to forgive. Even if people don't deserve forgiving, forgive them for your sake. Yes. Amen. Don't carry, don't carry around that burden of what somebody did to me. Right. Pull it off. But then after you pull it off, you know what? A lot of Christians will pull off, but they don't put nothing back on. Right. See, when you pull off your old ways, when you quit going to the clubs, and when you quit whoremongering, and when you quit doing your old lifestyle, don't just let that be enough. When you pull off the old, then the Bible says put on the new. Where you used to go to the clubs, find you somewhere else to go. Find you some other people to hang with. Find some other way to enjoy your lifestyle. You see, a lot of folk, they get saved, they come and receive Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior in their life, and they determine that they want to live right, and so they quit doing a lot of things they used to do, but now they're bored. And they think Christianity is a boring lifestyle. See? And now they, that's just like what Jesus said. Jesus said if a man is, if the old spirits or unclean spirits are cast out. He said those unclean spirits, they'll go around and they'll search for somewhere else. But if they don't find anywhere else, they'll come back to the same house. You. And whenever they didn't find anything replacing what used to be there, they'll move right back in. And the Bible said they'll bring seven other spirits worse than them. So when we, when we confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in our life, we got to find something else to do with our time. We got to let the Holy Spirit fill us where that old spirit used to be. And when you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you, you'll begin to put on new lifestyles. You'll begin to enjoy some new things. See, there's a joy that comes with salvation. But you got to learn how to, to get the joy of salvation. Amen. Amen. There are pleasures in, in godliness. But you got to learn how to get the pleasures out of godliness. You have to change the way you live. Change your lifestyle. Change your environment. Now, I know in some environments you can't change. But some you can. Find you some new friends. Find you a different place to hang out. A place that will build you up. So you won't go back to what you used to be. He says in verse 25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking evil, wait a minute, putting away lying, every, speak every man true to his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. He didn't say you weren't going to get angry, but when you get angry, don't let anger take control. Amen. Everybody get angry. And do you know sometimes you won't do nothing about something until you get angry? Oh, come on. It will. Until you get angry with a cert, about a certain thing, you won't do nothing to it. But don't let anger lead you in the wrong direction. So he says, be angry. He didn't say they didn't get angry. Don't get angry. He said, be angry and sin not. Don't let the anger take control of you. 
okay? It said, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Get it straightened out today. This 27, that's very important. Neither give place to the devil. Do you know unless you give place to the devil, he ain't got no place? You have to allow the devil to have room in your life. He can't take over your life. But you got to stop giving him place, stop hanging out where you used to hang out, stop doing what you used to do, make changes in your life. He said, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that are in need. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Anything that's corrupt communication is anything contrary to the word of God. It says, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all be, and if you realize all these things are things are telling us to do. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We're talking about spiritual maturity. We're talking about growing in the Lord. We're talking about pulling off and putting on because God wants you to grow. There are some things that God has for us that we won't ever get until we start pulling out, until we grow. And once you grow, then God will begin to release a lot of your inheritance. The Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for them that love him. God are holding them or withholding them from us because we're not ready for it yet. You wouldn't want to give a 12-year-old a, a big Harley Davidson motorcycle. You wouldn't want to do that because you're just giving him something to kill himself. Amen. So what you do is you wait until he grow up. Teach him the ways of the road. Teach him how to respect traffic. Teach him how to, to, to be alert and aware before you put him on that thing. Amen. The same thing God with us. God got so many blessings, so many things he wants us to have, but we're not ready yet. Amen. But when you grow up, God got them for him. Yeah. Amen. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Father God, I thank you so much. In the name of Jesus, for the promise that you have given us, I pray, Father God, that you help us to grow into the point where we can receive the blessings that you have for us, that we'll be a blessing and glorify your name, that we'll be a benefit to other people, that they can see you in us, and that we can walk in the promises, knowing, Father God, it is your will that we prosper and be in health. It is your will, Lord God, that we live in 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 and fullness of every promise that you have made. So we trust you to do it. And we thank you for it. Thank you for being a forgiving God. Thank you for being a loving God. Thank you for being a God that continue to make a way out of no way. Lord, we thank you. We trust you. And Father God, I pray you would touch the hearts and the minds of everyone that hear this word and realize that you have a lot for us and a lot that you want to give us. All we got to do is grow. And so we thank you for it. We claim it right now, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, because we know it's already in us. We just got to learn how to produce it. And we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Now, we're going to talk about the process later on of growing the starting place and how we got to move from one thing to another. And we'll probably talk about that in Bible study some. So I hope you all don't get tired of hearing the word of God because uh, learning comes through repetition. So don't get tired of hearing the same thing over and over because the more you hear it, the more it will become a part of you. And when it become a part of you and get into your spirit, then you'll start, auto, it'll become automatic. It'll automatically work in you. You'll automatically resort to the word of God. You'll get so used to victory that you won't want defeat. You'll, you'll realize that defeat does not belong to you anymore. Amen. Because God got some great and wonderful things for you. We, we got blessings with your name on it. Just waiting on you to grow up till you can get it. Father God, we thank you right now in the name of your son, Jesus. And Lord, if there be somebody here today that don't know you as Lord and Savior in their life, I pray you would touch their heart, letting them know, Lord God, that you are a forgiving God, letting them know that you are a loving God, that Jesus Christ already paid the price for every sin that they have ever committed. I pray, Father God, that you draw them to you, that they would know you as Lord and Savior in their life, and to begin the growth process that they will walk into victory and not be victims in the world. 
We thank you for it. If there be somebody in here that don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life, we invite you to, to, to come and receive him, become a part of the family of God. God love you. There's nothing that you have done that is so great that the word of God and the power of God, the grace of God will not forgive you. God love you. This is your opportunity. Would you please stand? If you desire to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your life, we invite you to come down. If you are already saved but you need a church home, we invite you to come. If you, hallelujah, if you have a sickness in your body or something, anything special that you want us to pray with you about, we invite you to come. We'll join our faith with your faith, believing God to do what we cannot do. For the benefit of those that are at home and even those that are in the office, we want to lead you in a prayer that will invite, that will cause you to become a part of the family of God. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, he will save you. A simple prayer can change your destiny. Right now, you just pray and say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And when I receive you, my sins are forgiven. So, Father God, I receive you right now. And I believe, according to your word, I am saved. Thank you, Father, for saving me. Come into my heart. Be Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may be able to have the strength and the power to live godly in this present world. I receive it right now, Father, and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you pray that prayer and you're here in the building, you need to be able, you need to find a church home. If you don't, if you're not in the building, you still need to find a church home, find a Bible teaching church where you can learn how to grow in the Lord. And we'll continue to pray for you too. So if you, have, if you pray that prayer, we need you to come down and we can give you some information on how to be strong in the Lord, information on who you are in the Lord, and we can pray for you for whatever the situation is that you are dealing with. For those of you that are on Facebook, YouTube, we leave you with these words. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If you desire prayer, you may come. And we will join our faith with your faith and pray with you concerning whatever it is. If there's anything that involves you, God is concerned about it. This is your opportunity to come.